Praise God. Well, open your Bibles with me, please. In the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, and we'll read only verse, what verse is that? It looks like 13, verse 13. And then we'll go to Matthew chapter 4 right after that. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now go to Matthew chapter 4, if you will. Matthew chapter 4, just a couple of pages later, or earlier rather. And I want to ask you to do this with me. I miss Pastor John Osteen. Pastor John Osteen of the Great Lakewood Church. But I still watch him on YouTube a lot. His son Joel. Barely anybody knows about him, but anyhow. <laughs> he continues the work and does very well. But John Osteen used to say this. I want you to raise your Bible. Say it with me if you will. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same, never, 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 I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. So, the Bible says, lead us not into temptation. And today I want to talk about Jesus, who overcame temptation. And we'll look at it in Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I want you to first notice... That the Lord, the Holy Spirit, actually led Jesus into the wilderness for a purpose. And that purpose was to be tempted by the devil. Now that's, a, that's, that's something that I'm still trying to, to figure out here in this, uh, this, uh, this brain of mine that you see behind this handsome face. So that God would actually allow Jesus to be led by the Spirit to be tempted. But let me tell you what I do know. I said it this morning, actually. You know, they talk about vaccinations. And I don't know much about how they work, you know, and I don't jump for every vaccine. I don't even take the flu shot. I'm not saying you shouldn't take it, but I just, you know, I, I, <laughs> I haven't done it and. And I don't even know if I want to take anything for COVID. You know, I, 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 I'm not saying you shouldn't. I just don't know. But, but what I do know about vaccinations, I, I, I've had the, 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 what's it called, the, uh, the mumps, you know, and the, what's the other thing, the measles, and those kind of the tetanus, the tetanus. I remember I was at a mechanic's house, uh, at his shop, and he was working my car. And I was getting hungry, I said, you know, I just want to walk across the street and, and buy something there. Because we were talking about the Lord the whole time. He turned to me and said, have you had your tetanus shot yet? I said, my, my what? My tetanus shot. I said, yeah, we went on a mission trip just the other day. We had to renew it. Otherwise, they didn't let you into the country in India. He said, okay, well, then you'll be safe. You can take my car. When I got into his car, I realized, what a mess. I mean cans and cokes and, and, and tune up cans and whatever. I've had my tetanus shot yet so I can use this car. Um, so, but how a, a shot works from the limited information I understand is somebody, you know, when you've had, say, chicken box, for example, from that point onwards, you're immune to it because your body has a way, it's got antibodies that, that, that there's little soldiers in your body and it fights, you know, the issue. It fights the, uh, the, the invader. And I just want to say, by the way, we do have over here mosquito spray. So if any bugs bother you, we are right here. So help yourself, please. Um, 
So, so you got these antibodies that are like little soldiers, and they they fight the infection when chicken pox. So, but after a while, the chicken pox is defeated, and now you have in your bodies little soldiers that know how to deal with chicken pox, and you just never get it again because they you already had it and it's in there. So that's basically my understanding. There's much more to it, but you know what? Jesus had no sin whatsoever. Yet Jesus was tempted by the devil. Jesus was tempted and Jesus overcame the devil's temptation. And what happens is that when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Christ comes and dwells in your heart, dwells in your being, and when he comes in, he brings with you, with him, the new nature that you receive. And that new nature has been tested, has been tried by sin, and overcame it. It's almost like the antibodies of Jesus, the little soldiers of Jesus. I'm really talking in human terms right now because... But that comes into your being and you receive the nature of Christ that was able to overcome sin. The wonderful thing about Jesus is he never sinned. He could have. God does not sin, but Jesus as man could sin. His human part could. And so when Adam and Eve were made, they were sinless. How many of you know God did not make Adam and Eve with sin? However, Adam and Eve eventually See, the difference between you, you and I, listen, you and I have, have, have we, we have sin in, in the inside of us. We have a sin nature inside of us. And then that sin nature appeals to the sin and we are tempted that way. But Adam and Eve did not have a sin nature. So their temptation did not come from a sinful nature that, that was yearning for sin. Their sin was from the outside in, not from the inside pulling it in, but from the outside in. They opened themselves up to their sin because they did not have a sin nature, but but when but then it became their sin nature, and that sin nature was then given to every one of their descendants as we are here today. Everybody is sinners. Amen. Every one of us are sinners. I should say we're sinners, but I'll get to that in a moment. But listen. Then the Bible says Jesus is the second Adam, or the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, I believe, verse 45. And when Jesus came, he was exactly what Adam was as a man. Of course, on the inside, Jesus was God himself. But Jesus came to earth as God, but put on human flesh. And I tell you, he dwelt just like a normal human being amongst us. I mean, he was not born grown up. He was born a baby. He cried. When he wanted his milk, he made a bigger deal. And he wanted his milk when it was time. Amen. And, and everything. He, 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 he had to crawl. He had to learn how to walk. Have you ever seen little babies walking like a room at the orangutans? You know, I just love you know, how little babies walk. And I remember my son Anthony, he was, he made his first steps in South Africa when we were visiting his grandparents there. It was very special. And so, so Jesus had to walk like that. And, and, but through it all, he never sinned. He did not have a sin nature. It would have been a great kid to have, honey. No teenage issues. How many of you know what I'm talking about? No, I mean, what a, and eventually Jesus grows up and age 30. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Making a twofold thing. Number one, Jesus, it gave Jesus the opportunity to overcome sin. To do what Adam did not do. Jesus was able to overcome sin, to show his dominance over sin. And I'll touch on that as we go. But the second thing is, when Jesus was tempted is that now when we accept Jesus Christ we receive his new nature 
And that new nature is the nature of Christ. It is the nature that already had been tested by sin. And just like those antibodies that I talked about, when Christ comes and dwells in you, let me tell you what, you are no match for sin. Sin will get you down. But when Jesus Christ is in you, and when you yield to Jesus Christ, I'm going to say something shocking now, and this is it. Do you know that you do not have to sin for the rest of your life? Now, I know that's a strong statement. And I know that we don't always live up to it. But I'll tell you when it, we don't live up to it. It is when we fall into the flesh. And I get to that also. I've got a lot of things I'm going to share with you tonight. But the Bible says that walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk in the spirit. So, so the, when you sin is when you don't walk in the spirit. When you get out of the spirit and right there into the flesh, that's that's when you that's when you sin. But you know, when you walk in the spirit, you could, at least theoretically, and I believe practically and in real life, as we continue to allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, get to the place where you never will have to do another sin again. How many of you know you already sin like one hundred times less than you did? a while back, let's just say 20 years back, whatever. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. And that's called sanctification. Now, I know I'm big Methodist country and Wesleyan country, and, and they call the holiness. And, and the Pentecostals actually came from them also. They called holiness. And what the holiness means does not only mean keep your hair in a bun, no makeup, you know what, that's not what I'm talking about. But the holiness tradition was this. There was a second work of, of, uh, of uh, grace. And I'm not saying for or against. I'm just stating. I'll tell you what I do believe in a moment. But John Wesley, the father of Methodism, they believed that when you get saved, you get saved. That's the first work of grace. But then there is a second work of grace where you... Pray until the Holy Spirit comes and He touches you and they use the word sanctifies you. And at that sanctification moment, from that day onwards, you will never sin again. Now, I like that. It's powerful. I think maybe the theology needs some, some straightening, whatever. But who am I to talk? I'm still learning myself. How many of you are still learning as we go together on this journey? Amen. There's things that I'm still learning today. There's things I learn now, and I look back, and I'm thinking, man, I can believe that I preached that back then, but I know better now. Because it's a process how we get to know the Lord. But this is what I do believe. I like what the Assemblies of God say. They say, sanctification is a one-time ongoing process. I like that. It is a one-time ongoing process. So the Holy Spirit comes, and it gives you that sanctifying power but then it's an ongoing process. It doesn't mean that you're not going to slip and fall, make a mistake, whatever. But it's an ongoing process as you keep on being sanctified. It's a process of sanctification. And I believe we can get to the place where that sanctification is complete. And maybe that's the part where John Wesley came and said, he may, he may have experienced that by age 26, you know. But some people might only happen by age 80 where that sanctification has come to its fullness where you have no longer you, you, you never sin again amen how many of you know what i'm talking about i remember a guy who was in baltimore and he was talking about the uh you know the beltway in baltimore is called the 695 okay he said how many of you know about the 695 block nobody knew about the 695 block He's talking about the 695 block can really test your sanctification. He says, have you ever been on the 695, which is the beltway? Now, Heidi knows about the 695, but she knows more about the 495. How many of you know the 495? That's the one that goes around D.C. Let me tell you Heidi's story real quick. And they say a pastor's wife has the right to remain silent because everything she says and does will be used as an illustration. 
But when she was younger, she went to Liberty University out in Richmond. And she had a younger brother, Jonathan. You know Jonathan, two years younger. He also went to... to, to uh, and so, so one day, Heidi's coming back with her car and Jonathan, her younger brother's driving in his car, just trusting his big sister. And Heidi had a friend in the car. And the two of them were talking away. They went all the way from 95, went to 495, and went to the right, you know, east, where you're supposed to connect with 50 and then go to the eastern shore. So they went right past 50 and kept on going, and kept on going the whole thing. And they're just talking away, talking away. And Jonathan in the back, he's just, he knows, you know, I, I'm glad my sister knows where she's going because I have no clue where I am. Did you go around that once or twice? One and, a half. Uh, one and a half times and before they realized, you know, we should have been by 50 by now. <laughs> but that's the 495. But the 695, this preacher in Baltimore tells me, he says, how many of you know what the, four nine, the 695 block is? He says, let me tell you. Have you ever been on the 695 and you are driving in the fast lane and there is some idiot in the fast lane driving 50? And somebody else is on the middle lane, also driving 50. And there's somebody else in the right lane, also driving 50. And here you're stuck between, behind these 50 mile an hour people. And you are now stuck. He says, this is the 695 block. <laughs> I remember he said, how many of you now know what the 695 block is? Then he left his other hand. How many of you, the devils use you to make a 695 block? <laughs> you don't want to see that. So, so, brothers and sisters, this is what, so, so, but I tell you, you can break out in a sweat. Amen? Like, I, I, I might lose my sanctification when I get tailed. I mean, I can tell others, but I do not want to get tailed. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't tell nobody. I, I, but, but I tell you, when somebody's behind me, I, I'd rather just pull off and let them go. I just don't like to be tailed. But, but, but you know, your sanctification will always be tested. But eventually... I believe the Lord will bring us to a place where you have victory over temptation. Hallelujah. Can you just raise your hands and say, Lord, bring me there in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now that puzzles me too. Because when I fast, I get hungry the day before I fast. If I know I'm going to be fasting Two days from now, tomorrow, I'm going to be very hungry. Man, I eat everything I can. But Jesus, after 40 days, and actually they say that's when true hunger comes in because oftentimes your beginning of your fast, you're hungry, but it's not. It's just your flesh. But then the hunger goes away. They say after two or three days. Now, I can tell you, I fasted many more days than two or three days. I only lose my hunger a few more days after the two or three days. And that's basically when you're in the spirit, you're not focusing so much on the natural things. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou art the Son of God, command these stones to me, make come bread. Now, that's a twofold temptation. Number one, it says, command the stones to become bread. Do you think Jesus was able to turn the stones into bread? Yes, he could. And he could have had a good meal right there. I mean, he, he, he made the blind to see, he walked on water. What is it for him to change? But if he did that, he would have short-circuited God's plan for the man Jesus. Amen? But here's the other thing he says, If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. And that shows me how human Jesus really was. Because there's no doubt Jesus is God. Jesus is Jehovah God. Let me tell you, Jesus is not a junior God. He's not a second God. He's not a second God person. He is God. I'm writing a book about that right now. He, he is God. He is God. He is the almighty God. He's not a second God or a demigod or a junior God. He is God. And as God, He could still be in heaven and on earth at the same time. And when He came on earth... He put on human flesh, and, and this is the thing. He became a man. So Jesus was God, and he was man. Amen. Now, as man, 
He was like us in every single way. I'll give you a scripture in a moment. He was like us in every way. I talked to how he crawled, whatever, except for sin. The only way that he was not like us was for sin. He also aged. He got some wrinkles, whatever, as time went on. You know, his body was just like yours and your life. But he never sinned. The Bible says he was like us in every way except for sin. Now, this shows me how human Jesus really was. Because let me tell you, when he was human, he was not half human. He wasn't half human and half God. He was 100% God and 100% human. So much so that at times, he who knows everything did not know the time of his second coming. I mean, Jesus as God knows everything. But yet, he did not know the day of his second coming. Jesus, as God, doesn't need to eat, but as human, he hungered and ate. Like over here he hungered. And he hungered and ate from, from the, he went to the fig tree and all that. As God, he never sleeps, but as man, as a human, he had to sleep. He was so tired, he slept in the boat, in a storm. I don't know what hit me today, but after this morning service, I went home, I didn't had a cup of tea, and I just laid, laid on the bench. And I tell you, I slept from 12 something till 4. I mean, I dreamt. I, I mean, I was like R.I.M. type dream. I was in such a deep sleep. So I'm full of energy tonight, man. I, we're going to go late here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm good for, for 12, p, not, uh, 12 o'clock tonight. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I won't do that. So, so Jesus slept. But you know what? For it to be a, a real temptation for Satan to say, if you are the son of God. It was a challenge on his identity. Because we know he was the son of God. All his life he knew he was the son of God. When I was 12 years old, he went to the temple and, and he said, I'm about my father's business. When, when Jesus, all his life, he, he just knew he was the son of God. There was no question until the tempter came. And for the tempter to be able to tempt him to say, if you are the son of God, shows that Jesus was so human that it was possible that Satan could pass, cast doubt in his mind that he was the son of God. And let me tell you what, Satan will always come and cast doubt on your identity. If you are a child of God, why are you messing up sometime? Amen? Normally, when it's this quiet in a service, I'll turn to the other side of the congregation and say, maybe I'll have some more luck over here, can I get an amen? But I'm stuck with you, you're all I got, so you've got to help me here tonight, amen. Yeah. What about this section over here, can you help me out? Come on Heidi, you've got to help your husband here. So, Satan will come and say, if you are a child of God, but I love the way Jesus, it says, but he answered and said, but he answered and said, it is written. Somebody take your Bible up one more time. Say, it is written. It is written. See, your, your Bible, your Bible, your, your Bible is, is, is not there to, to collect dust. It's not there to be a nice little look. Sometimes we have a Bible open in our house and it looks nice. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not going to help you unless you read it and get it into your soul. Get it into your spirit. My friends, Jesus knew the word. And he said, it is written. What does Ephesians chapter 6 say? It says, put on the helmet of what? Salvation. And the shoes for the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the shield of faith. And the breastplate of righteousness. Man, you are well informed. And, uh, and the, the, the girdle of truth. And then it says, and take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. My friends, I heard a preacher say, that's your only offensive weapon. Because the shield is defensive, so forth. But the word is the offensive weapon. I remember the way we have a connection here with Joyce is... Her father, we had a revival up in Dover. We were preaching there at church, Eagle's Wings. And her father, uh, stepfather, right, mm -hmm. told her, would you, we're having a revival this week. Would you like to come? And she said, yeah, I'll come. But that night before that, 
she was praying and she was getting into spiritual warfare and she got so she took her bible amen and she held it up like this and she began to declare the word of god with with strength and with with vigor amen how many of you know we need that sometimes not these tiptoeing through the tulips type of prayers we need some prayers like we did here tonight for a couple of you amen and uh she went there and she even started shouting like a warrior cry like yeah and uh anyhow so she came to our service in the revival and i you know i felt feel led by the spirit i called her up and i didn't know her from adam not that i knew adam as well but i didn't know her from adam either and i asked her i said i prayed for her and as i prayed i saw a vision i said joy uh, well I probably asked your name but joyce I see a vision of you with a sword in your hand and you are flinging that sword and I see you shouting a warrior cry like ah and I see that you've been defending and now God is taking you into the offense with a sword of the spirit which is the word of God she just told me that the story the other day I mean God knows your mail amen when the Holy Spirit shows you some that's so you know how the Lord speaks when you don't even people don't know you from adam but the lord gives a word my friends let that bible one more time somebody say Aah! amen Aah! hallelujah my friends we got to take that sword of the spirit and when jesus pulled that sword out sinner was like uh oh he knows the word he knows the word it is written and man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of god and the devil took him into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if, if, if you are the son of God, see that temptation. Same thing again, if you are the son of God, Satan really wanted him to doubt his sonship. Throw yourself down for it is written and here it comes. The devil knows scripture too. For it is written, he thinks he can quote scripture. I will give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up and dash you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. But look what it says again. Jesus said to him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Now let me tell you something about that verse. The way that we often, how I was taught it as a kid, is don't do nothing stupid. Don't get up there and, and jump out of a perfectly working airplane skydiving and i did that i love i love para parachuting amen i didn't all do all these tricks but i just I, had, I probably had about 15 20 jumps in the army i i loved it but there were people who told me doesn't the bible says thou shalt not tempt the lord your god i'm not going up there and jumping out of there i'm not going on that roller coaster i'm not going to tempt the lord my god but that's not what the idea is over here let me ask you Listen, Jesus took it a higher level. Satan said, if you are the son of God, was Jesus the son of God? Yes, he was. Then Jesus took it a higher level. Jesus turned to him and said to him, now listen, Jesus showed him not only am I the son of God, meaning I'm God in the flesh, but I'm also God himself. Because he said to him, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Oh, hallelujah. Satan trembled. Satan was messing with Jesus' sonship. And Jesus already overcame that part. And Jesus said, while you're on the matter here, let me tell you who I really am. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord standing right in front of you. You are the one that millions of whatever years ago you rebelled against me the lord your god and i saw satan fall like lightning from heaven and you became you came from being lucifer the light bearer the beautiful archangel to a little wimpy ugly demon devil and and here you are today satan but devil i want to know you to know you trying to tempt me to subject myself to your things but i tell you you shall not tempt the lord your god i am not only the son of god but i am the lord myself hallelujah Amen. Amen. yes give the lord some praise 
And you know what else? He didn't just say like, stop tempting me, devil. I don't like being tempted. Amen? Stop it. <laughs> no, no, no. When Jesus, the way Jesus did it, he was like, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus took authority over that temptation. And you know what we can do to the devil sometimes? We can tell the devil, devil, you shall not tempt the son and daughter of the Lord our God, the Almighty. I'm a child of God and you shall not tempt. And all your temptations will be futile. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I tell you, we, you, you hear us preach. We never preach condemnation. We're not always up, you know, about how you should dress. And I should, I, and we should dress modest, amen. And I'm not about all those outward things. But let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, sin is sin, and it sends people to hell. And all that sin alienate themselves from God. So we've been clear about that. But what I'm telling you is, we're not preaching condemnation, but what we're preaching is domination. We're telling you, you have power. You can tell the devil where. We can go stick it. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Okay, so now the Bible says, Again the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Before we continue reading, in Revelation it says, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and His Christ. The Bible says that that's that belongs to the Messiah anyhow. So the things that Satan tried to tempt Jesus with was Jesus anyhow. Except that Satan was given the idea, you don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to go through all of that. Just worship me. Look what he said in verse 9. He said to them, to him, all these things will I give you. If you will fall down and worship me. Fall down and worship me. What nerve for the Lord and being the son of God to fall down and worship Satan. What nerve. But a good exchange. Don't have to go to the cross. I don't have to save millions of people through my blood. I can have the kingdoms of this world and the, full, and the glory of them. But look what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. It is written. Did you notice three times already? It is written. It is written. How do you overcome temptation? You overcoming by declaring it is written. I, I've seen people. I mean, some of the silly Christianity can have some of the silliest stuff. I feel so. I feel so embarrassed sometimes when I think that Muslims are watching this and Jews are watching this, and I, I see how I suppose exorcists, Christian exorcists take a cross and then point it to the devil and then the devil's like Wah! you know that's a big show you know my friends you don't overcome with a little crucifix you overcome by the cross by the blood of the lamb amen not pointing this to them but satan 2000 years ago the blood of jesus destroyed you amen this the, the devil falls before the word of God. The devil falls before the Holy Spirit. That's the weapons of our warfare. Not a crucifix. I even seen some Christians put a, a Bible on somebody's head. And as if the Bible is going to help. That's just pages. With all due respect. But it's just pages. Made of, made of, uh, of wood and leather, plastic. Imitation wet leather. That's all it is. But if, you, if you have that word in your heart. And you speak forth the word. Reinhard Bonnke. Reinhard Bonnke, he said these words. He said, God's word in your mouth is as powerful as God's word in his own mouth. How that happened was, Reinhard Bonnke was a young evangelist in, in Lesotho. Lesotho is a tiny country like Delaware. The size of Delaware. Maybe even not that big. And it's right landlocked within South Africa. And by the way, I read in the news today, they found a 440 carat diamond in the Sutu. 
I don't know if it's the biggest in the world or not, but they found it just this last week or so. But in the Sutu, Bonk is a young evangelist. He's just winning souls, him and his wife Heidi, <laughs> yeah, wife uh, uh, Annie, from Germany, and they're preaching, preach, drawing small crowds. But on the inside of him, he knew there's something bigger. And there used to be a great evangelist in South Africa those days. And I have had the privilege of speaking to him. He's still alive. He's like over 80 years old. His name is Dan Bosman. And a powerful man of God. And uh, so he asked Dan Bosman to come preach for him. And Dan Bosman was well known in South Africa back then. He was like the big evangelist. So they brought him over. And Dan showed up and Bonky advertised for the first time. He had like hundreds of people in a hall, you know, hundreds of people. Normally it's like 20 people out there on a street corner, but now it's got like hundreds coming to see not Bonky, but Dan Bosman. Because his name, you know, everybody heard about him. And Dan Bosman preaches and everything. And then he wraps up the service. He tells to Bonky, he says, uh, we have to, have to go home. He said, but you haven't prayed for the sick yet. Well, I'll pray for them tomorrow, but the Holy Spirit just told me I have to close the service. He said, well, okay. So they closed the service. He said, tomorrow we will pray for the sick. They told everybody, tomorrow we'll pray for the sick. So tomorrow came, Bonky rides all the way to go, go see Dan Bosman, uh, have breakfast with him, whatever it was. When he got there, there's Dan Bosman with his safari suit and his suitcase all ready. He says, uh, Reinhardt, uh, I'm leaving. You've got to take me to the train station. Bonky is like, what? He says, yeah, I, 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 I got to go. And Bonky and him go back and forth. But we advertise. All these hundreds of people are coming. Last night, you didn't even pray for the sick. And, and, to, and they're expecting you tonight. And, and now you're leaving. And they went back and forth until Dan Bosman told him. The Lord told me that I have to go back. That's all he told me. And suddenly it hit Bonky. And he said, if the Lord told you, then you must go. It'll be okay. So then he went. And Bonky dropped him at the train station, whatever. And on his way back, he realized, I'm all alone. Got hundreds of people waiting at the service tonight. What am I going to do? And Bonky says, as clear as day, he was driving. And the voice that makes the difference. The voice of the Holy Spirit came to him and said, My son, tonight you will speak to the crowd and you will heal this. I will use you to heal the sick. And he said, My word in my mouth, I'm sorry, my word in your mouth is as powerful as my word in my own mouth. Bonky arrived at the service, hundreds of people there. And I made an announcement. He said, I want you to know that the great evangelist that you all came to see he is not here today he had to go back to south africa but i want you to know that jesus is still here today and bonky he said jesus will heal the sick and bonky preached that message like crazy he preached the message as if he was the the well-known healing evangelist when he was nobody so to speak but he had a pure heart after god and he preached. And then he said something amazing. He said, I want all the blind people to come and stand up here in the front. And then all the blind people come. Now this is somebody who's never done this before. And he, they stood all in a row. And he says, I'm going to pray for you now. And when I'm done praying for you, you will see a man standing on this platform. And he prayed in the name of Jesus. And he commanded the blind eyes to open and all of that he prayed powerfully and suddenly somebody in the front said i can see i can see started shrieking started screaming i can see and somebody on this side said i can see i can see and and all over the miracles started happening <coughs> and all over the place the deaf began to hear the cripple could walk. All that because Dan Bosman was obedient to the Lord to say, 
the Holy Spirit told me to go home. And that repelled Reinhardt. And now Reinhard Bonke is now going to be with the Lord in March. Uh, in March, I actually went to his funeral. And uh, he was 79 years old. And he led 79 million people to Jesus. And miracles upon miracles. When I was in, in Nigeria with him, I spoke to the man that you can see on YouTube. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Daniel Ikechuku. He was dead. Not clinically dead. He was dead, dead. It was for a couple of days. And he was raised from the dead in Brian Bonke's meeting. And uh, all the things. You can go check it out on YouTube. Brian Bonke, dead, resurrected. You'll find that story. It's amazing. My brothers and sisters, but that word from Rana Bonke, my words in my mouth is as powerful as my word in my mouth. God told him about his mouth. So my friends, let me tell you, when the devil comes to you and says, you're going to die of your sickness. No, take the word of God and says, no, it is written that I shall not die, but I shall live and declare the praises of God. When the devil comes and says that you are going to be destroyed financially saying no my God shall supply in all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus when the devil says you always going to 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 do uh, all these promises <coughs> that you think God gave you they're never going to come to pass you say no it is written Praise God. It is written. Thank you, Jesus. It is written. And, and, you, and you say what the word of God says. It is written. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. If you are the son of God, Jesus said, it is written. My friends, let us get the word of God on the inside of us. And quote the scriptures to the devil. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's give God some praise here today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit here today. Hallelujah. And look what Jesus said. Away with you, Satan, verse 10. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord your God. He had just told him, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now he took it to a higher level. He said, me, fall down and worship you? No, devil. He didn't just say like, that's not nice. We only worship God. No, he told Satan, if anybody's going to worship anybody between you and me today, it's not me laying down before you. You shall worship the Lord your God. And him only, me only, shalt thou serve. Have you ever seen it like that? Praise God, isn't it powerful? Look what it said. Jesus said, away with you, Satan. For it is written, you, devil, shall worship me, the Lord your God, and me only shalt thou serve. Come on, let's give the Lord another hand of praise. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the day when this world will bow the knee before Jesus. I tell you, I was talking to somebody this morning, and I said, when, you, when they say that when you sp say a lie, when you speak a lie, Speak it so big and make it so outrageous and say it so many times, repeat it so often that if you do that, eventually people are going to start believing you. And I tell you, we've seen in the last couple of months, riots and everything. I don't want to make light of the reality that happened, but lies have been spoken. Big lies, big lies. And... Repeat it so often that everybody believes it. Because if you have CNN and MSNBC and everybody saying the same thing, you're like, well, I don't know what they're talking about, but I guess it's going on. And then you start thinking like they think. Like the prince of the power of the airways. Come on, somebody. Amen. But let me, let me tell you what. I don't know how God's going to do this. Because the devil's got the airways. The devil's got his fingers in the politics. He's got his hands in, in the, the, the deep state. I'm not somebody pretending I know everything about the deep state. But let me tell you, there is somebody out there that's like a puppet master who just does what he wants. Amen. I, I, I don't understand all of that, but I know it looks hopeless sometimes. 
But then I remember what the Bible says. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of His Christ. And I do know that the day will come, listen to this, where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that He is Lord. When He says every knee, that means a democratic knee. It means a Republican knee. It means a socialist knee. It means a Muslim knee. It means a, a, a Buddhist knee. It means a, a Hindu knee. It means a Catholic knee. It means every knee shall bow before the Lord our God. The the one who takes over and this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It's starting to feel like revival here tonight. Amen. Man, I tell you, God is in this place. But we know we're going to be running these aisles here today. Amen. Well, let me end this to this. While you're still excited about the message. Because there's a certain point where people like, it's a great message, but you can stop now. <laughs> Amen. So let me just go through this pretty rapidly. Uh, this things I have not even... Actually, I preached this morning, this evening's message. So remember the one in James? If you want to see this evening's message, go watch the morning message. Because <laughs> I preached that already this morning. But I want you to notice. I'm going to give you seven things. How to deal with temptation. Number one, walk in the spirit. Galatians 5 verse 16 says, Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? How do you walk in the spirit? The word with means one with. So you walk with the Holy Spirit. We tell you He's with you all the time. Not only is He with you, but He's in you. If you rely on Him, He will give you power over sin. Number two, don't find yourself into temptation. Don't put yourself in a situation. A lot of sins can be avoided if you avoid the sin. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, chapter, oh, I didn't even write the reference down, but it says this. Oh, I did write it down. It's Proverbs 4, verse 14 to 15. Do not enter the path of the wicked. And do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. And do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. That's a good word. Don't find yourself in temptation. If you have a, if you have a problem with ice cream, don't buy it and put it there in the refrigerator just for in case. Amen? Because I tell you what, at some point, you're going to hear a voice from the refrigerator. Come here, dear one. <laughs> I remember a guy, and I don't make fun of it, but anyhow, I probably do. But I remember he had pornography problem. He also was low on money. So what he did was he paid for cable. And then he went to the Playboy channel and he recorded hundreds of hours of pornography on his those old VHS tapes. Then it, then it shut down the cable because there was a preacher saying, turn off the cable, saying, turn off the cable. But he still has the, the VHS tapes. Then when he wanted to, he watched them. But then he, uh, he kept them in his house. And he had hundreds of them. Uh, but he says, pray for me that the Lord will give me victory over the temptation for pornography. So we talked about it in a while. And I said, you know. I can't pray for you until you do something. I said, what you can do is you can record over those tapes. Just, you know, you push the record and the play button together and record Andy Griffith or something. You know, just record over it. He said, oh, no, it will take a lot of time. It's, it, will take hours, it will take days to record over everything. Well, didn't he just take days to record? You know, so, and I realized... He's not committed to get over victory. I said, well, you can also, because in those days, at Kingdom Tapes, you could buy a thing that's got a magnetic thing, and you can wipe them over the, over the tapes, and it erases everything just by going, oh, that's like $20, you know. Oh, he doesn't have $20. I said, okay, um, well, I do have one more option. At Lowe's, 
you go to the sledgehammer aisle. They're this big, it's $8, it's much cheaper than a $20 thing. <laughs> and you go and you make war with it, you crash them, you know. And he wouldn't do that either. And I realized the man loves his son too much to get victory over him. Now, I'm not, please, I'm not condemning whatever, but I'm just saying the truth here today. Can, can, can I speak the truth? You've got to hate your sin to get overcome in those sin. And my brothers and sisters, praise God. Don't walk. Don't, don't walk. Don't find yourself in a temptation. Number three, you've got to resist. James 4 verse 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's a promise. Let me tell you, the devil is very scary looking until you resist him. As soon as you resist him, he will flee. It doesn't say he will say, all right, we'll talk later. He says you will flee. The word flee means flee. I mean, you just run in terror. Amen? Just check it out. Next time Satan tempts you, resist him. And you'll see him flee. Number four. Oh, that was number four. Uh, okay, that was number three was resist. Number four. Now, I could preach a whole message on just this one. But just write it down. Genesis 39, verse 6 to 12. You can read it later. Do you want to hear what you should do? Do you want to hear number four? Flee. So the previous point was resist and the devil will flee. Here it says you flee. That's the story of Joseph. Remember Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife. All day long she was saying lie with me and he would not and all that. And one day she, she grabbed his, his cloak and said lie with me. And he and he tore himself away and she stole the cloak in his hand and you know what he did? He lifted his skirt and, and fled. Some temptation. Don't resist it. Just flee from it. Oh, I'm preaching good here today. Because that's a form of resistance. Sorry, Rita, I said I'm preaching good. She always, she's my, uh, keep my straight director. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number five. Rely on the power of God. Zechariah 4 verse 9 says, he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Let me tell you, by the Holy Spirit, you can have power over sin and over temptation. And number 6, speak the word. I already preached about that a lot this morning. Matthew chapter 4, this evening. Speak the word, declare. And number 7, repent. I'm sure there's some more. But let me tell you, if you have not properly repented from your sin, you're prone to go back there again. It's kind of ties in with the one that I said a little earlier. But you've got to hate your sin. You've got to repent of it. And if you truly repent, God will give you power over sin. Heavenly Father, thank you that we could preach your word tonight. Thank you for the wonderful spirit that we experience here tonight. God, I feel the heavens are open here tonight. Oh, the, the, the meetings here are just incredible. We might just be a few souls in the service and every service, but Lord, one thing is true. There's an open heaven above us, and God is working here, and I love it. And Lord, today I want to pray in the name of Jesus that the power of the Most High God will give your people power over temptation. Jesus said, lead us not in temptation. And another possible way to translate that is, you do not lead us into temptation. But Lord, I say today your people will give us will get victory you will give your people victory over temptation let's just raise our hands right now do you want a prayer just to god to strengthen you over temptation right now i pray for you i pray for the people on youtube heavenly father in the mighty holy name of jesus i pray for you to give your power your people power over temptation Lord, I come against every devil, every demon in Jesus' name. And I command every devil, every demon to take their hands off of God's people. No matter what the issue might be, no matter what the weakness might be. Lord, I release, so to speak, sanctification over your people. That they will be conscientious of their holiness. That they, will be, that they are to be a people that are holy and without blemish before the Lord their God. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about pureness, of holiness, 
of mind and heart and soul and body. Oh God, I pray for any secret sins. If you have any secret things you've been struggling with, let's take authority over that right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, every secret sin, we pray for power and victory over temptation. Maybe think of one thing that you still have weakness in. You know, one or two things, three things, whatever. And let's just really focus on those three things, one thing, whatever right now. Lord, I pray that you give your people victory in that area that they're thinking of right now. Another area on another day, maybe, Lord. But this area that they're thinking of right now, this Pharaoh shall see Moses' face no more. In the name of Jesus. Oh, come power of God. I feel that power. I feel that power. Come power of God. Shoo. Sure. God delivers you right now. God gives you deliverance and victory right now. <laughs> In Jesus' name. Do you receive it? Just say, Lord, I receive it. Lord, I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, how many of you glad we, we are at church here today? Thank you, Jesus.